Thank you, Kevin, for joining me on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've got a question. What are your interests, Kevin? I got a lot of them. I played tennis in high school and college. I still play tennis today. I play a lot of golf, but any competitive activity, chess, whatever, I'll play board games. I play volleyball, pretty much dabbled in most sports, basketball, baseball. I like to travel. I have a 10-year-old currently. We are in Oregon for a few weeks in the summer. I live in Florida, but out here just enjoying not so hot weather and humid weather and doing some hiking. It sounded like you accumulated a lot of experience playing sports. Yeah, I was going into high school. I didn't, I was always athletic or did some things. My parents really forced me to, like, you, you got to play something. And I credit them with that because I, I made a lot of friends playing sports and through college, that's my main friend groups were people that I played tennis with and other sports. It made me more social and I really credit them for forcing me to do that and thank them for that because now I have a lot of lifelong activities that I can do to keep me healthy, fit, as well as my mind fit. Mm -hmm. I think it was a good compliment to your studies to have the kind of sports integrated with, with math. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have an outlet. Can't. It's hard to just be in a room all day or the library all day. It's good to be out exercising, get your mind doing other things. I always think of math as being like a creative outlet and the more, more ways that you can use your brain and create connections, whether that be through sports or games or conversation, then the more it can help develop a math skill set. Yes, that's great. I'd like to transition to ask you about tutoring. Have you, did you get tutoring when you were uh, studying? No. I was oftentimes the designated class tutor, whether our class was, usually my classes were under 30 people. I went to a small school. And in my master's program, they were under 10 people. But an undergraduate, for sure, we'd have a group of 10 people studying for a test and to be like, is, is Kevin coming? Hopefully Kevin's coming. He can help us study. So that, that was, it worked for me, though, too. It was my way of studying. If I can teach it to the rest of the class, then I know I'm good. It helped me understand it more to try to communicate it to a small group of peers. So you've got a lot of tutoring experience. Why do you enjoy tutoring, Kevin? I like the communication aspect. I like being able to creatively explain something because everyone's different. I like the being able to just creatively adapt a new topic to each student to find a way that it sticks with them. It's a way to keep my brain going. And maybe I can relate something I'm saying that makes a connection to what they know more about in life to make something stick. I'm always trying to find a new way to explain something. Awesome. And what do you think is the key to success in math? So you mentioned there that you explain things in different ways and you communicate very effectively with the student, which seems to help. But what would you say is the key to success? The key to success is being open to failure because at my university, I taught a lot of remedial math classes and factory algebra courses. And uh, the number one problem was students not doing the work because they didn't know 100% how to do it. I don't know if I'm going to get it right. So I'm scared to do it or something like that. Some sort of fear of failure. So the only way to learn in math is to make the mistakes, adapt to those mistakes. Okay, all right, I made it. All right. Next time I won't do that. You have to be okay failing and making a mistake. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think yeah. a lot of people are afraid even of asking questions. Yeah. Sounding like they don't know what they're doing. That's okay. You're in the class for a reason that I don't, you're not supposed to know. If you knew what you were doing, you'd be on the other side. Yeah. Definitely be okay asking questions. So parents listening, they should really talk to their kids about asking questions when they're not sure of something and really trying to be brave and not be afraid of getting the math yeah. question wrong because it's not the yeah. end of the world. That's my favorite. My, my favorite type of question is when a student says, why is it like this? Not just, that's better than how do I do this? I like the why question because that has, now I know they're engaged. They want to know where did this come from? How does it fit in with everything else? And that leads me to my next question is that what can students do to maximize their learning? So you mentioned asking why, like, why does this <laughs> work? What can students do to maximize their learning? It maybe sounds basic, but uh, at least with math, you got to practice, right? You can't, you can follow what I'm saying all day, but if you're not, if you're not actively writing it down and following the logic from your brain to your hand, to your paper, then 
there's going to be a disconnect three days later when you try to recall it. The line of logic is very clear in my head. So when I explain it, I try to make it very clear in whatever way you're going to understand it. And you could say that you could nod and say, yeah, I get it. That makes sense. But again, three days later. So that's something that I just came to mind is doing the work, doing the homework, working on problems immediately after learning them. I am normally a procrastinator, but I do remember with my math homework, it was always go to math class, do the math work. It was never, I got class three days from now. I got a whole weekend. I'll do it on Monday morning or Sunday night. It was, I just finished class Friday at three. I'm gonna go do an hour's worth of work. So I get to hammer in what I just learned without any gaps in that. Like when it's fresh in your head, that's the time to practice. And yep. That, make, that makes a whole lot of sense. If you could do anything without failing, what would you do, Kevin? Yeah. See, so tying that back into the previous statements or questions, I don't know if I would I don't know if I'd choose that route. That seems too easy. Are we learning anything if we're not failing? I feel like if I'm not failing, then I'm not pushing myself far enough to grow. I don't know. I would abstain. Bring me more failure so I know that I'm growing in small doses. I don't want to be just like, I need some success in the middle, but. Right. Cool. And what experiences in life, you mentioned that you're somebody who appreciates learning from a good failure. What experiences in life have taught you those important lessons? Well, that's a good question. As an undergrad, it was more about maybe trying to fail less when it mattered. So I would often, I don't know how much my advisor approved of this. She never kicked me out of her office, but whenever she had office hours, I would just go sit in the corner, not in her chair, because I didn't want to take up anyone else's time. But if anyone had an important question, they would come in. But I would just sit in the door doing my homework. And if I had any questions, I'd be okay. I would just be like, hey, you got a second? I appreciated having learned to ask questions. Like that was okay. That was a big help to me having like essentially having a professional tutor sitting right next to me being like, hey, I don't know how to do this problem. Can you, or I'm stuck here. Can you give me a nudge in the right direction? I'll go back. That really, I guess I was motivated to do that because I didn't want, I wanted to perform well on the test. So it was purely failure on test avoidance strategy was learn to ask questions before it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. You, it seems that math is something that you can't, for lack of a better word, BS. So it's a reality check. It is. And you don't want to have that reality check when it matters. Yeah. That's so true. I've got specific questions about your morning routine. What, can you tell me a little bit about your morning routine as a math tutor? Maybe it should be like afternoon routine because <laughs> I, so I have a daughter. So my morning routine is probably, we'll say just revolves around her. She has to get up and go to camp in the summer. She has to get up and go to school. So I wake up with her, make breakfast, get her ready, prepared for school or whatever she has for the day and drop her off and come home and then probably just relax for a couple hours because most people don't tutor. I tutor mostly high school or college age students and high school students, they're in school till three. So I don't really, my job really picks up in the afternoons. So yeah, my morning routine is daughter centric and just relaxing or maybe doing some, maybe exercise or something just to prepare for later. Cause most of my afternoons are full. So you've got a lot of, a lot of business and you ease into your day. It's nice that you can balance tutoring and family life because you're a family man, two jobs in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps to be able to tutor online and be able to do it sporadically and choose your hours. They're chosen for you. Like I, I try not to turn down any business, but so I'd, I'd like to work as much as possible. So it's a forced hand. I really would like to tutor from 10 AM to 3 p.m., but not many people are free that time for us, but I do a little bit of freedom. I'm in, an, I'm in Oregon on vacation now, still working. It's nice to be able to travel and work. That's nice. And what's one thing about your business, your tutoring business that happened and you didn't expect it? Like any surprises? Just the continuous business is always surprising to me. It's kind of, it's my only job. It's not a side job. So I do need to work enough to sustain mine and my family's life. I transitioned out of the university. I have one business partner that I work with and we have our, our company and it's never slowed down. And that's surprising every once in a while, like during Christmas break, when business is slow, I'm like, is it gonna pick back up? Well, so there's always like a fear of what's going to happen. But after a few years, I started to gain confidence that it'll just always, it seems to keep working out. So that's 
continually a surprise, but a good surprise because thankfully it keeps going. So must be doing something right. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome that you're successful and it's working out for you. Thank Um, you. I've got a question about tutoring for you. What's a common myth about your job as a math tutor that you would like to address? This might not answer that directly, but the common myth that I hear the most about math just in general, not as Mm -hmm. my, not my job in general is, is that people think of math or grow up learning math in a rote linear way. And the questions are always, how do I do this problem? Give me that step. How do I do this and this? How do I do it? And then new topic, new problem comes along that is like a slight variation from the last one. Oh, give me the steps to do this one. So they think of everything as compartmentalized. So it's a very, it's a very narrow thought process towards, thought mm-hmm. towards math, but that's where I think the biggest, that's the biggest myth I think is because math is wider, right? The wider you can make your gaze into math, the, the easier all the things become because you start to see a connection from over here to over here. And then you can start to apply what I learned over here to what I learned over here. Right? And that, that goes on at the highest levels of math. And that's something that most people don't know because you don't get updates on your phone for math developments, but you, you oftentimes see someone combinatorics coming up with an answer to an analysis question because they creatively adapted the algebra and analysis to a combinatorial sort of notation. And they were able to find the solution another way that these people would have never thought about. It's not linear. It's very wide reaching. So that's the myth that is impossible to dispel. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I try to dispel it, but it's a wide reaching myth. That's great. What's one of the biggest (laughs) challenges that you're facing in your, in your role and how are you tackling it? Currently for our business, what you're asking, it's how to deal with growth. It's very nice and us contained currently. But with continued growth, it's hard to figure out scaling. Like currently my partner and I, we work from our homes. We communicate via text, but if I add two more people, then those texts become more complicated. And do we need a location or an administrative person? So it's very difficult to take the next steps into making the business one step larger. I don't, both of us are math people. We're not marketers were not, I guess we're entrepreneurs, I would suppose, but we didn't go to school for that. We don't, we don't have business degrees. We don't exactly know what the best route is to go for it. So that we're grappling with that at the moment. Cool. I've got some math questions. I, I wonder why, what do you say about why is math important? You get that question often as a professor, especially for the classes I was teaching. Why am I going to use, when am I going to use the Pythagorean theorem? I was at the store yesterday and I didn't use trigonometry at all. So I get the question so much, you just roll your eyes sometimes, but it's important to learn regardless of what your future goals are, because it helps create an analytic thought process. You're not always, it doesn't have to be working with numbers. Most of the math that I did, you can attest to probably in your degree, it doesn't involve numbers a lot. It's a lot of abstract thought processes. So the better your abstract, analytical, logical thought processes are, that applies to everything. I'm, I feel it's made me better at connecting dot in different realms. It helped me do better in all my other classes. I went to a liberal arts school, so I took classes in theater and art history and religion, and it made me better at connecting dots from class to class so I could recall things better because I was able to directly connect these things. I think that's the importance of math is Mm -hmm. developing the thought process. Are you going to use sine and cosine in your job? 99.9% of you will not guarantee it. If I wasn't tutoring, I wouldn't be using it. I might think about it. Sometimes I have fun with it, but no, you probably won't be using too much advanced math. That's not the point of it though. No. Great. What is the future of? In what sense? I hope in the sense of my goal and my sense and just the narrow sense, I hope that students change their perspective. That's the future for me is it's right now it's maybe truly accepted that math is, it's okay to not be good at math or not care. Like you ever notice in movies or TV shows or anything? Everyone's, ah, I got to skip class today. I got a math test. It's never, I got to skip class today because there's a English paper due. Well, maybe it is, but most of the time what sticks out of my, my mind is mm. it's always because there's a math test or I didn't do well because my math teacher was an angry 
math teacher or something. I don't know. There's always something mm. negative to say about math. It just gets ingrained from a kid. You watch those shows, you don't think about it, but I think about it. I see them all. I'm like, why do you always got to talk bad about math? Yeah. So I think it's just ingrained from subconsciously from an early level that kids are like, math is not as important as the rest. And I, that my hope for the future of math is that changes somehow. Maybe our TV shows start to accentuate math and say the use it as a beneficial thing. So that's what I hope. Maybe yeah, that's I, not what your goal of the question was, but yeah. No, I think that's perfect. Let's make math cool. If it ever was, but at some point it was more cool than it is today, I think. Awesome. Why do students struggle with math? Because of TV. <laughs> for, for to the last, I don't know. For the same reasons as before, they fear failure. It's something that they're naturally, it's abstract. It's harder to grapple with and communicate about it. That's the hardest part is being okay talking about it and like stuttering through it because it's not something that you normally talk with friends with. And that's what helped me in college when I was the designated tutor for those classes is I was forced to talk through it and communicate effectively. So the better you, the more you try to talk about it, you know, I've heard people or the strategy of trying to explain something to your dog. It doesn't have to be, yeah, they, you could talk to your fence. It doesn't matter. Just talk it out what you know. But there's a verbal disconnect in your head. You're like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. Then you start to talk about it. You're like, I don't know the word for that. I don't know how to say that. So the more you try to talk it out with someone or thing or whatever, the better. So would you agree that a lot of kids these days, they're not studying like the best way? that you ought to for math, like you ought to practice and recall things. Yeah, it's every student has their own study habits. So I don't know collectively if it's a generational thing at all. I'm yeah. sure there are students still practicing well. And that's got to change from person to person. I knew through practice what I needed to do and how much I needed to do to feel comfortable with the material that I always, that I always complete all of the homework problems, but I know I, I looked at them and I said, I, I don't know how to do this one and I'm going to build up until I can do that one. And if I get to this point, then I feel pretty good that when I ask a question, I'll be able to fill in the blanks for the rest of them. And that worked for me because I knew that was going to get me to a proficient level, hmm. but that, that varies from person to person. There, there are there people out there that can just hear it and recreate it. Probably few and far between. Most people need more practice than I pro than I probably need it. So it's finding that level and being okay putting in the work to do it. How do you stay motivated to study, or at least when you were studying? That's I guess I was just I was always self motivated. I didn't ha I was always I wanted to be. I, I didn't. I don't like losing to any in anything. So that probably came from sports and growing up with an older sibling. I was always the smaller one. I been competitive since elementary school on a bowling team. So I've always had this competitive edge that I wasn't going to lose to anything. I, there's nothing, no one to lose to. I'm not competing against anyone in a math class, but I always was like, did I get the highest score? So, I was, so there, there was some self-motivation. I, I know everyone doesn't have that, but, or that same like drive to beat everyone else, but there's some, everyone has some level of self-esteem that they want to uphold and they don't like getting a bad grade. So I think that is the motivation to study enough to achieve what you're okay with. And we just have different levels of what we want, what we're okay with in each class. I even did that for, I'm sure the website still exists, but like rate my professors websites or whatever. And one of my history classes, I don't even remember it was, I think it was just, I got assigned a professor and everyone else was dropping the class because they said the professor was really hard. And I was like, what? I'm not dropping it. I'm going to, I'm going to beat him or whatever. I was like, so I took the class and I'm pretty sure I got an A in it. If it was the history class that I'm thinking of, but I was like, why would you drop it? Why don't you? And I saw that as a challenge. Like that kept me motivated, a challenge. I, if it gets boring, like then I'm not motivated. So as long as there's a, I guess that's the answer to your question, making something a challenge to yourself, something that you can always see progress in. When you see progress, then that motivates you a little bit more. Just keep it interesting. And, yeah. And make it a game. So if you're a competitive person, try to beat your friends. <laughs> if you're a completionist, try to do all the homework, like every single right. question. That's, that is something that, that helped keep me going, having the answers in the back of a book. And right? if I would do a problem, check the answer in the back of the book and see that it was right, then it, that's the little nudge in the right direction that you need. So being, having immediate feedback is nice. And there's lots of online programs that, that people do their homework on now that give you immediate feedback 
So there are some positives and some negatives to those, but that's outside outside the point. But I, the immediate mm -hmm. feedback is nice to keep you motivated, knowing you're doing something correct. I really love what I love what you're saying about that almost dopamine hit when you yeah. solve a problem. Exactly. Yes, that's a good way to put it. And it feels so good, right? It's yeah, accomplish something, even something so small. Yeah, but you yourself did all the steps saw through the logic, wrote it down. Yeah, it's, whether that problem was easy or hard, subjective, person to person. But yeah, knowing that you're capable on the smallest scale of succeeding is that's a, certainly a dopamine hit. And what can the parents listening do to develop that intrinsic motivation for their kids? Kids are tough. Give a safe space to be okay with failing. If you are very harsh on them mm. and they they fear your reaction to them making mistakes, then mm. that translates over into an academic world as well. Allowing them to feel safe is fine. Giving them a safe place to make mistakes can allow them to learn from those mistakes and grow and see that they know how to do things. And just like with the math problems, doesn't matter if they're learning to walk or learning to ride a bike or whatever, when they see that they can do it, then that gives them the confidence and motivation to keep trying new things. Yeah. Yeah. And I was wondering, could you tell me about a student that you helped and uh, what kind of outcomes you may have had? Most recently, I don't know, do the, are there AP tests in Canada? Okay. So most re most recently, I think this week, the AP scores came out for AP Calc for the previous year and I helped a few students throughout the majority of the year in Calc AB, so Calc 1, and Calc BC, Calc 2. And I just got a couple text messages this week about uh, both of, two of them getting fives and being really happy that they performed so well. And one of them's going on to take, uh, this wasn't even an option for me in high school, but she's taking Calc 3 and differential equations in high school. So hopefully help her next year. And the other students taking stats, AP stats. Not sure he'll need my help in that class, but I'll be available if he wants it. So that was, it's always nice to hear that uh, students were successful in a year long endeavor. So before they were struggling and then after a year of working with you, they got five, which is like <laughs> perfect or close to perfect or it's the highest score. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's the highest score you can get on the AP test. Yeah. <laughs> it's. Yeah, it's a weighted scale. I don't even know how they calculate it. The test is out of like 150 points or whatever, but yeah. So the highest level you can get is a five. Great. And you are available for hire this summer and this fall at tutorocean.com, right? Yeah, you can find my profile on Tutor Ocean. I believe I've already helped a student or two for a few Calc 2 classes through Tutor Ocean. Usually, uh, historically, the past few years, I do get pretty busy, pretty fast, which is a good thing. But yeah, currently my schedule is open pretty much 24 hours a day. I don't really try to shut anyone down on my website. My hours are from like 6 a.m. until midnight. So really any time is okay. Pretty flexible. What subjects can you help students out there with? Any math topic I feel pretty comfortable with, ranging from Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, Differential Equations. I've no, so I've taught all those classes. Anything else I am willing to help with, but that gets hyper. Anything after Calc 3 gets professor-based. <laughs> My linear algebra course could be completely different than someone else's linear algebra course. It's not like a nationwide curriculum like Calc 1 has. So it's very hard to tutor someone in a class after Calc calc three because the topics could vary widely but i do like to help like i that's how i continue to learn like we'll gladly accept help or accept a, a job just under the disclaimer hey this course could be completely different than my course but i, I do feel pretty comfortable with my ability to read back like, learn it on the fly so i'm happy to take anyone in an abstract help anyone in an abstract algebra course or an analysis course or i was helping someone in a complex analysis course a couple of weeks ago, and it was different than my two complex analysis courses, but I remembered enough to, to make it work. So any math class, I feel pretty good with my ability to help out and I have no problem telling you when I can't, but I also help have helped people historically with SAT or ACT prep, and I've done a bit of physics as well. So those are all things that I feel pretty good with. Yep. Oh, I feel great with all the math topics. I feel like, eh, I'll do the other ones, but not my favorite. Cool. What should a parent say 
to you when they want to get help? What do you mean? Just suppose I'm a parent. Like, should, what are the questions I should be asking? Or, or how many times a week should I expect to meet? Yeah. And to get what <clears throat> result, right? Yeah, that's going to be student dependent, but usually one one hour a week is sufficient to keep up with a class that's running at a normal pace. There are lots of students in summer classes that I see a few times a week because of their accelerated pace. But usually once is once a week is good enough because I can I have the being a tutor gives you a unique privilege because a teacher has more responsibility ability to do all the nitty gritty things that students, that's when students tap out. They're like, do I really need to listen to this part? And they, they probably should because they're going to understand conceptually it more. So that as a tutor, I, that's our, all the nitty gritty has been done. And I get to knit, I get to pick out the highlights and what I think is going to be the most valuable to each student. I, I don't have to worry. I know they've seen all the, the details. And if they miss the details, then I can go back and fill in the gaps. But I get to pick out what I think is most important for each for each student. So that makes it easier for me. So one, one, once a week seems to is mostly good because I can tell what they learned during the last week. I can tell how well they understood it in a short amount of time. And usually with enough, give them a preview of what's to come. So for the next week. So yeah, once a week's good. But again, that, that changes from class to class and student to student. Some students, it's going back to your question, it's more student, to, it's more a question of what I would ask the parents about the student as opposed to what the parents would ask me. I, or even I would talk to the student and, and one of their backgrounds. The more I know about the student's background, the easier it is for me to adapt to the student. Because lots of students in a pre-calc class may have a somewhat deficient algebra background. And maybe they conceptually understand all the pre-calc concepts, but algebraically they can't factor or something. And that's gonna, that's gonna cause a problem in literally every topic in pre-calculus. And it's not a pre-calculus issue, it's an algebra issue. Maybe that's a one-stop fix, but so it definitely varies. I think you touched on a really great point about the knowledge gaps and how they affect future years math. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit like specifics? Like you mentioned factoring, not knowing factoring affects yeah. doing calc. It affects everything. Yeah. And that's something that a student's probably not going to pick up on. Maybe they would. The more, and the more you analyze your own mistakes, the more you're going to be able to pick up on that. So as a student, that's something that you can do to improve. But being that self-aware as a high schooler or a middle schooler, that's not something that is common, I'd say. So that's why having a tutor helps. That's my job is to be the self-awareness and help you find what you are, I don't say deficient at, but what you're just lacking, the gaps that you have. Like you might not be bad at calculus, right? You're probably not. Calculus isn't hard. The hardest part of calculus is the algebra part. And that's where students fail. Do they forget negative, how to use negative exponents. They don't know what a rational exponent is. That's going to, that's going to cause you a pretty big issue in calc. Properties of, properties of radicals. Factoring is the biggest one, right? Mm. You can't get away from factoring. You do logarithms, you got to factor. You do calculus, you got to factor. You do limits, you got to factor. And if you're not comfortable factoring a quadratic or recognizing a quadratic can be factored, it's, it's a lot of recognition. Then that's going to affect you year in and year out. And then you're going to start to feel worse about yourself. If that gets compact, see, it makes sense why students start to fade away from math because they get that compounded feeling of, I didn't get it then and I have, and I still don't get it now. Mm. But it could just be a quick, it could just be a couple fixes. Yeah. And so. like you said, you're the tutor is acting as the gap filler or the self-awareness is what you said. Yeah. You could fill in the gaps in elementary math, basic that are affecting like first year calculus. Yeah. It would be and, a shame to lose all the marks because of something you ought to have learned in grade zero. When do you learn negative exponents? Right. I, the good news is math repeats itself. So you don't, well, that's good news. I think it's good news. I always say it's good news because you learn it in grade 10. It comes back and pre-calc a little bit harder. And then, it, so they usually teach it twice. And then the third time they expect it. So by the third time you see it the third time and you're like, I guess here it is. So you're expected to know it for good after the third time. So mm -hmm. I like that math is a little bit repetitive in that sense from the learning perspective, because then it helps you fill in the gap because it's inevitable to have gaps, right? Mm -hmm. You don't just see it once and know it. You have to apply it and see it again and apply it in different ways. And that's what I'm here for is to identify those gaps 
quickly, quicker than most. I, that's what I would say my skill set is. Within 30 minutes, I can tell you where you're on the current topic, what your issue is, whether it's new content, cons- old content, or wherever the issue is, I can identify it pretty quickly. Is it helpful if a parent or student sends you their curriculum for the course or the course outline or syllabus, as you call it? Yeah, for sure. Depending on what the student's looking for. Some, sometimes I have some students now that I'm just over the summer, they are, they're proactive, they're motivated. They are not in a class. They just want to be prepared for the next class. So in that case, I always ask, well, can you get a hold of your next year's teacher and just ask for a syllabus or ask for the, just the book that you're going to use so mm-hmm. I can at least pull information and problems from what you're going to see. So yeah, it is that in that respect, it's helpful, especially when I'm just like, extemporaneously teaching a class like preemptively to a student that's definitely helpful in the middle of a class usually if i'm seeing someone every week i know where their class is headed and most curriculums for for high school classes up through calc one and calc two those are pretty standard like i know the progression of those courses i don't need a syllabus to tell me what's coming next i know what's going to happen but it's always what is value to me valuable to me is the having problems designed or chosen specifically by the professor because then i get to know what their professor was emphasizing. So if there's a specific topic and they don't, let's just pick something easy. Like say you're learning derivatives or something. And I see that the homework that was given is only polynomial derivatives and there's no exponential or logarithmic functions. And I know what to focus on. I don't have to pull questions from other banks of questions. I get to know exactly what your teacher is emphasizing at that point in time. That's what I would usually ask for from a student in a class that is ongoing, just what typical problems that they're looking at right now. And you also mentioned planning ahead and talking to the professors, getting getting the syllabus before you're actually getting the syllabus on the first day of class. Could yeah. Pairing that with a tutor of quality like yourself, and <clears throat> then you've got a plan for success. And, <laughs> and a lot of, let's be frank, that a lot of students are struggling with the math like courses that they're taking like they, and uh, they've got to do first year and second year math so what could they what could they do before the course starts to get ahead if you're independently motivated then doing exactly that getting a hold of your professor or teacher for the next year and finding out speaking from experience if i was a if i was a professor when i was a professor if i had anyone come up to me 6 weeks before the class started and say I really want to be prepared for your class. This is hold the phone. This is like the best news ever. Like this student I know is going to be successful because I can see that they're interested in being, they're interested in their own outcome, invested in their future. Just that alone makes me like, I can't speak for all professors, but I I can't imagine someone being on the other end of that and saying, sorry, just wait six weeks. Like they're going to be, they're going to see that you're invested and want to help and do anything that they can in that six weeks. Maybe it's just give you the syllabus. Maybe it's tell you, these are the topics that I think students, they have experience. These are the topics that I think most students struggle with in my class. And just knowing what those topics are, then you can take them to a tutor and say, I need, I want to make sure that I'm good on these because this is what my new, my future professor thinks I'm, most students struggle with. So that would be something if you're trying to plan ahead before a class to make sure you're successful, I think that's a good. Awesome. Kevin, do you have any packages available on Tutor Ocean that the parents could take advantage of? Yeah, I, I believe I do. They're there. I don't know what they are, but I made them. So they're a deal. They're better than individually purchasing them, but sure, they exist. Awesome. Kevin, thanks for getting t- to sh- showing who you are. And we're really honored and happy to have you on our platform. I do hope that parents and watching this, they'll pick you up and try you out with their kid. Or if there's any university student out there listening, you're definitely someone who can help them.